The Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism organization aimed at engaging the broadest possible public in the big systemic issues that affect us all. Water and sanitation have been a major priority for us the past three years with 17 separate uh, reporting projects uh, grouped under our downstream gateway and dozens of presentations at schools and universities across the country. We and our journalists have worked with many of the organizations represented in this room. We're grateful for all the help in getting the field information we need to place these stories in high-end news media outlets and then take them out to our network of schools and colleges. But I have to say that Sometimes we struggle a bit with some of the wonderful organizations for which you work. Sometimes groups are so focused on assuring a, quote, good story that they deny our journalists the free access that they need. They shepherd them through highly controlled show and tell visits that are more conducive to public relations reports than compelling journalism. They fail to record the long-term results that mark the difference between real, sustainable success and projects where the glossy, full-color brochures appear to last longer than the pipelines and latrines they extol. Those are among the reasons why this panel's topic and the recent emphasis in the WASH sector on collaborative approaches and sustainability is so important. The need for that initiative is as clear as some of the statistics on WASH activities. Uh, these are statistics that I think are familiar to you, but they're not so much to the general public, and I think it's important that the community, the sector, uh, deal with them before they become a driving factor in the public at large. Statistics such as that 30% of the 600,000 plus hand pumps installed in sub-Saharan Africa over the past 20 years failed prematurely. That less than 5% of WASH projects are revisited after project conclusion or that less than 1% of WASH projects have any long-term monitoring at all. Uh, this suggests an, an emphasis on bricks and mortar construction and a steady flow of new contracts instead of on permanent transformative change, an approach that might serve the interest of keeping all of us in business, contractors and NGOs and journalists alike, uh, but does less when it comes to lifting billions of people from the burden of unsafe water and inadequate sanitation. At a time when government and charitable resources are both constrained, we have to do better. We need to know why monitoring and evaluation have been such a low priority in the past, how much of that lies at the door of organizations in the field, how much of it is due to donor preferences, and how much is due to inadequate scrutiny by the news media and government oversight, and what we can do to ensure improved performance. With that in mind, we structure today's panel to hear from practitioners prepared to talk about what works, what doesn't, and lessons learned. Water First is a Seattle-based organization supporting programs that integrate water, sanitation, hygiene, education. Um, to give you an idea of our size, our annual budget is about $1.3 million, and we use that to support work in uh, four countries through our in-country partners. In three of the countries, we're working in rural areas, and the case studies that I'll be presenting today come from the urban and peri-urban slums of Dhaka, Bangladesh, where we support a local NGO called DSK. So what does it cost for us to evaluate and monitor our programs? Um, I did a QuickBooks report before coming here, and in 2010, we spent just 5% of our total program support budget to Bangladesh on monitoring and evaluation. A long-term commitment, funding commitment to DSK, really makes it possible for us to be penny-wise. We check up on past projects at the same time we are seeing work in progress and discussing future projects. When we visit DSK and our other partners, one of our monitoring tools is a simple checklist of sustainability indicators that we have developed over time. It includes criteria for items like well depth, water quality testing, surface seal, evidence of hygiene education, evidence of loan repayment, um, because users probably won't repay loans if they're not happy with their projects. 
This checklist is one way that we can identify patterns in project implementation that we want to discuss with DSK. You know, I think intellectually we all understand the need for monitoring and evaluation, but for many organizations, these activities will not have a high priority until investing in them impacts their ability to find funding for their work. Um, so therefore, um, this year, we are inaugurating what we're calling the Water and Sanitation Accountability Forum. The accountability forum that we envision is modeled after forms of self-regulation created in other sectors where associations have standards for membership and hold each other accountable through regular collaborative evaluations. In other words, um, we want to create a sustainability certification system that encourages strong project implementation, that provides an opportunity for implementing organizations to prove that they're delivering on their promises, and also gives donors a tool to differentiate organizations that are doing sustainable work from those that aren't. We are a social venture fund, so we are an investor. Uh, nonprofit by incorporation, but we're really investing in companies that are trying to serve low-income consumers um, with market-based approaches. So financially sustainable uh, approaches to issues like water, health, uh, housing, energy, agriculture. Um, so our monitoring goals are a little bit different. Uh, because we're working with, with companies, uh, financial performance is absolutely something we focus on. So how are the unit level economics at each water plant that, uh, that a company is running? Um, how uh, is the company thinking about the overall company financials and are they planning appropriately for the cash flows that are expected to come in against what they'll need to invest to get there? Um, second is understanding the customer. So I say customer because frequently that's what we're, uh, these companies are serving is customers paying for the service. Um, <coughs> So we monitor to understand who, what are the different segments of customers. Um, one village may look a little bit different from a village in a, in a different state of India, for example. <coughs> um, and there may be different segments within a village. Um, so what are the trends and patterns, patterns that we're noticing and how do we respond to that? Um, and then finally is, is estimating the impact. So we invest, we say that we want to have a social impact. Uh, we need to understand what level of impact is the company having, how many people are being served, um, and, and in what types of places are they being served. This is one uh, specific water point, one specific water kiosk, uh, and this is a daily sales trend. But there's, there's two fairly significant down periods. Uh, and, you know, looking at this data, we said, well, what exactly is, is going on here? Why is there, in this steady climb, two periods of just, you know, almost no water being sold? And uh, when we w worked with the company to dig into the question a little bit more, we understood that, um, you know, it really started with the entrepreneur, the, the kiosk vendor who was within the network of the company, um, but working as a franchisee. Um, we asked about the data and said, you know, why, did, why were there such big dips in those two periods? And the first one we found out uh, was a result of a death in the family. And in this particular um, uh, area of, of Eastern India, um, it's taboo to visit a family after a death within two weeks. So pe basically pe people said, well, we can't go visit that family. That's where the water point is. That's the person who we pay to get water. We'll, can, we'll, we'll find other sources for those two weeks. In the second period, we noticed a uh, similar dip. We said, what, what happened then? And there was a birth in the family. And again, there was uh, a cultural taboo around visiting a family um, during the first couple weeks uh, after a birth. And so that kind of issue is just something we wouldn't have found out about if we weren't tracking this kind of data. So Water for People is a Denver-based international NGO that works in defined geographical regions, similar to counties in the United States, with partners, local government, local private sector, and community partners to provide safe water and sanitation for everybody, every person, every community, every school in those areas forever. Water for People guarantees monitoring for 10 years. And the type of monitoring that I'm going to refer to is really post-construction sustainability monitoring. So are water systems functioning and being used once um, projects have been completed and are sanitation systems similarly being used and functioning? The reason we've decided to monitor and sort of stick our necks out there like this are, are threefold. One is we feel accountable. We must do this as an organization. We're accountable to all of our donors, all of our co-financing partners overseas. Two, it's a step towards being much more transparent. I mean, here we are again talking about the elephant in the room, the failure in the water and sanitation sector. 
Um, but we feel that e talking about it in a much more public way will get many others talking about it and that collectively we'll actually do something about it. And then the third reason, what I'm going to focus on today, is really what have we learned? What have we learned both at the project or program implementation level and what sorts of implications has that had for us as an organization? One of the, the tools we've developed at Water for People to help us be more efficient and effective is what we call flow. We've been doing monitoring for five years. Flow was launched last October publicly, um, and it's really a different, better way to collect this data. Um, it's on a droid, which I have here. Data gets collected on the droid. You can do it with an internet connection. You can do it without an internet connection. It can be collected in multiple languages. You can tailor the questions. Um, it really has made our lives a lot easier. 